Hello to all. Uh, it's nice to be in uh, New York and London simultaneously. I, I thank very much Adolfo Suarez and our ONTIE partners in London and Madrid for inviting me to talk about uh, professional ethics. Uh, this matter is for me uh, a paradox. Uh, when someone talks to me about ethics, I, I feel uneasy. Uh, you have seen persons that for no reason begin to tell you about their ethical behavior or, or, or they, they say that they, they are uh, ethical persons, whatever that means. Um, worse than, than that, my internal alarm system begins to ring when someone in the middle of a conversation uh, tells you, uh, I will be honest with you. Well, we have to thank them for not being dishonest. So, uh, actually, you know the, the popular saying, show me what you brag about and I will tell you what you don't have. So, instead of, of, of preaching about ethics, I would like to share with you a few thoughts about situations we face when we practice law. And I will begin with a story. A few years ago, a large multinational company sends a new legal director to Latin America, and she tells me that she wants to study the law of contracts applicable in my country. So I, I sent her a present. I sent her two university textbooks about contracts. Two days later, she calls me. Jose Rafael, thank you for the books but please tell me the cost, because uh, the company's code of business forbids uh, accepting presents for more than $35. Uh, the books were below that limit, so she accepted the present. Later, a few months later, something totally unexpected took place. The same company was found guilty of fraud by the Department of Justice in the US. They, uh, the company had to pay a fine of over one billion dollars. So we see that companies with strict ethical standards uh, with a very good reputation can be suddenly involved in embarrassing scandals. I am a, a believer in corporations. Corporations provide enormous benefits to society and they do follow ethical rules. But they are run by human beings. We are human beings and not all of us deserve a price for good conduct. In the past, when Corp when a corporate scandal broke out, um, you could do damage control by calling the editors of a few local newspapers or a couple of TV channels. Today, uh, damage control is nearly impossible. A public relations expert uh, told me that today, they talk more realistically, not about uh, damage control, they talk about damage, litiga uh, damage mitigation. Today, any journalist, any, any person with a Twitter account can spark a wave of bad press, and this bad press can stay there forever, uh, regardless of the, no, uh, of the right to forget uh, uh, legislation that is now being implemented in some jurisdictions. Today, uh, all persons relating to a scandal, guilty or innocent, they will appear where their name, when their name is Googled by authorities, by compliance departments of banks, or by anyone who wants to check on their background. This has serious practical consequences. In our time, an international 
crusade is conducted against corruption. It's a justified crusade. Uh, the point is that innocent people can be trapped, can be unfairly trapped on the law enforcement net. More and more countries are signing exchange of information agreements. Uh, more countries are implementing rules like the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act in the, U in the U.S. There is the OECD uh, rules on bribery. And you now know about the FATCA legislation uh, in the U.S. Those rules are applied, are increasingly applied, considering the economic substance or the legal form. Authorities seek, for example, who is the ultimate beneficial owner, who is the UBO. They disregard the legal entity. Um, yet, when legal form is disregarded, a door is open, is open for uh, discretionary measures, for very unfair uh, consequences to innocent people. Uh, in our time, any legitimate international transaction can be halted because the bank's compliance team Resolves to freeze the funds, the price, uh, the funds that just arrived. And here the presumption of innocence. Uh, the burden of proof are reversed. The banks, the bank will freeze the funds until you prove that the origin of the funds, the origin of the funds is genuine. And, and wait, the funds were paid by the other contractual party. And without the cooperation of the other contractual party, you don't have means to prove how they got the funds. So uh, we now have to consider ethics in many situations. Not only when we choose a client, not only when we take a case, uh, not only when we advise clients about how far they can go in their contractual relations. Now we have to advise our clients about the risk of doing business with a particular third party. To put it in some other way, uh, a small ethical problem we solve today can indeed avoid a huge legal problem tomorrow. In the past, uh, when, we, 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 when thinking about ethics was uh, to think about principles that we learned from our parents, our teachers, or in philosophy books. Now, modern constitutions, uh, those constitutions enacted after World War II, have incorporated moral values in their body of articles. In the beginning of most constitutions, you will find a whole catalog of ethical principles like justice, equality, fairness. Uh, proportionality, which is very important. Those principles are now positive law. They are no longer programmatic guidelines. So those ancient principles of natural law are now positive law. And, and those moral principles have legal enforceability. They occasionally, especially in hard cases, they can prevail over legal rules to the extent that those legal rules collide with the values or the principles of the Constitution. This is not only a theory uh, by scholars like Professor Robert Alexi in Germany and other prominent philosophers of law. These are decisions taken by supreme tribunals in Latin America and Europe. The, the bottom line, the contemporary reality, is that moral issues are increasingly, increasingly becoming legal issues. And there is more. Social rules, like uh, rules about good manners, 
are increasingly becoming ethical rules. For example, if I buy a mis mistake, I say something politically incorrect, I may be disrespectful with a friend or a colleague. But if those same words are pronounced by an officer of the company, a, uh, the employee can bring up a lawsuit for uh, discrimination. So uh, the dividing line between this, what is socially correct, what is legally correct, and what is ethically correct is tending to disappear. When, when we were children, we were told to stay out of trouble. Our parents told us, don't run into problems. But um, in the legal profession, running into problems is part of our jobs. The problem of our client is our problem. If our client is in trouble, we are in trouble. This empathy with our clients will help us help them. Sometimes we are uh, next to our client in, a, in the middle of litigation or in a nasty conflict. And we sometimes have to play hardball. In fact, uh, our tough conduct today in the negotiating table can avoid costs and can avoid a lengthy litigation. In those difficult cases, the client does not need a spiritual leader like Dalai Lama. The client needs a lawyer that is prepared to implement a strategy, an aggressive strategy. And as you know, sometimes the best defense is attack. I, I don't like military metaphors, but this is an exception. In defending the interest of our client, the legitimate interest of our client, we are not Boy Scouts. We are warriors. The only difference is that our, is that our wars are civilized wars. They must be conducted within legal and ethical rules. In our, in our quest for ethical truth, we can rely on many sources. We can, we can study philosophy, and there we will find that moral issues we face today were already being discussed by the Greeks more than 20 centuries ago. From then on, history teaches that there is no single theory about ethics. Ethics is a branch of philosophy. And all those theories, even those theories that we reject, can help us, can help our critical reasoning. There are specific written mat materials about ethics. We, the lawyers, are bound by, in, in, perhaps in every country, by codes of professional conduct. Uh, numerous clients have codes of business ethics. Those codes are not dead letter. In fact, traditional authors on commercial law do not comment on a relatively recent corporate institution, the so-called CCO, the Chief Compliance Officer. The Chief Compliance Officer is vested with internal powers to enforce not only the law, but also the code of business ethics of the company. And they can bypass the CEO and they can report directly to the board of directors. But not only codes, not only written materials, there are other sources of ethical truth. Just as there is a customary law, 
which is unwritten, there are customary ethics. They are also unwritten. There is a body of behaviors that are generally considered as proper, as acceptable in a particular business community. These unwritten business practices can help us deal with ethical issues that are important. We learn by example. We teach by example, especially our younger colleagues. There is this aphorism, practice what you preach. Allow me to turn it around. We preach with our practice. So, also important, in my view, are simple tools such as conventional wisdom, the common sense that is not so com common, uh, wrote Jose Ortega y Gasset. Common sense can tell us when a situation goes beyond legality, and we begin to realize that other values are at stake. Loyalty, fairness, compassion, politeness, and uh, a value that is not easy to define, decency. Common sense is also related to intuition. We unconsciously train our minds to detect what can go wrong. We have a sort of uh, internal radar. We have a smell test. Uh, personal security experts say that when for no reason you feel insecure, you are insecure, so leave the place immediately. Finally, there is dialogue. And here I would like to recall a brilliant philosopher of law, Carlos Santiago Nino from Argentina. Nino passed away too young. He was only 50 years of age. Yet he wrote landmark studies about ethics and the law, a relation that has been tense, has been under discussion for centuries. We are lawyers. Let me try to explain what Carlos Nino told me, what he wrote. We are lawyers, we can prepare persuasive arguments. And we can also develop arguments to persuade ourselves. And in ethical issues, we tend to draw the line when it is more convenient to us. In a gray situation, in a middle ground, when you have arguments for or against a particular conduct, we come up with uh, a typical argument. This is not good, but we have to do it because our competitors are also doing it. So, Professor Nino said that individual analysis about the ethical truth is biased by our own self-interest. Accordingly, the ethical truth, according to Nino, can only be found by discussion with others. Others perhaps less biased than us. They can give us a more objective perspective. We are bound by professional secrecy. We are bound by confidentiality. But we can discuss matters with our partners. Or uh, in hard cases, we can delete, we can exclude names and circumstances, and we can discuss the main issue, issue, the core issue, with a mentor, with a professor, with someone that can share some wisdom. 2,000 years ago, two Greek intellectuals, Socrates, Socrates and Plato, they Plato wrote dialogues, uh, and it shows that he showed that a good dialogue is worthwhile. 
I want to thank you all for uh, uh, being so kind in listening, and I wish you all the best.